Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Adlan Fela, Chief Analyst at Maravedis Research. I know the name Maravedis is hard to pronounce for, for certain people, but, you know, we're very excited here to have Keith Parson. He's the Managing Director of the Wireless LAN Professionals. Hello, Keith. How are you today? Good. Glad to be here. Glad to meet you. Well, thanks and for I, I, joining I, us. I'm one of those who have a hard time pronouncing Maravedis. So. <laughs> Distinctive enough. Tell us, what is Wireless LAN's pros mission? Oh, well, first, Wireless Line Professionals is just a, an, initially just a company that does Wi-Fi consulting. We've been around for 25 years or so, been in the Wi-Fi space for a long time. But what we're really known for is we put on a conference called PC, Wireless Line Professionals Conference. We hold it a couple of times a year. And so we have a big group of people who do Wi-Fi as a living. That's their job. And they like to get together and be part of a community. So we kind of offer that community service. We still do Wi-Fi consulting around the globe, doing installs, designs, troubleshooting. But the thing most people know us for is the conference. Okay. And who are typically your members? Probably about a third work for a vendor. They, they are in the industry because the company they work for has some product or service that sells to Wi-Fi people. About a third work for resellers, the channel partners who help design Wi-Fi, and about a third are the end customers themselves. But all of the people who come are focused, the majority of their day is based on Wi-Fi. They might do some other little networking stuff along the side. The reason why it's split between those groups is most companies, by far, unless you're a really big company, you don't have the resources to dedicate a Wi-Fi professional just to your company. So say a hospital, they might have you know thousands of employees and they may or may not have a dedicated IT person to Wi-Fi specifically. So they might use a reseller or, a, a, or a, somebody else that helps them along the way. And so they are sharing that Wi-Fi specific resource. And then obviously vendors who sell into this marketplace have to have their, their SEs and their developers and, and the people who do Wi-Fi for a living. So we kind of try to cater to all of those people. Hello, everyone. This is Adlan Fila. I'm a Chief Research Analyst at Maravidis. Maravidis is a boutique wireless infrastructure analyst firm since 2002. Over the last two decades, we have been helping customers with research, consulting, and marketing services. Some of the areas we cover include the conversions of Wi-Fi and cellular. In fact, we're known for our longstanding relationship with the Wireless Broadband Alliance, for which we have produced the industry annual report. We have three ways to work with us, from marketing essentials for startups to custom large custom projects. We can discuss those projects individually. And those are some of the customers we have helped in the past. So feel free to reach out to us to further discuss your research needs. Thank you. Okay. Do you have to be a CWNA, CWNE to be a member? Oh, no, no, we have, we have no criteria there. Though I would say the majority of our people who attend are at least CWNA, usually, usually higher. We have a pretty big percentage of CWNE showing up. We, we shoot a picture every year of all the CWNEs who are in the audience and they get together. So yeah, we have a, a high percentage of the CWNEs, but there's no requirement other than you just care about Wi-Fi and you want to do Wi-Fi. So, so these people mainly caring about enterprise Wi-Fi, right? It's not much residential oh. or... Yeah, I, I, obviously they all do residential at their own homes and their family and friends, but that is not their target. One of the reasons is our conference is kind of unique in that we have no vendor sponsors. There's no vendor booths. There's no vendor marketing. There's no vendor speaking slots. And so the since that money isn't available as a conference organizer, the end user, the people who attend are the ones who pay the bills, not, not the vendors. So it's a, it's a fairly expensive ask for someone who's only making money doing residential. The enterprise market space has more expensive gear, more, they have more engineering design. Mm. And so there's more money involved in that space than in the residential. Okay. Fair enough. So what are the main technology pain points you're tackling this year? They actually haven't changed in the last 25 years. Is the <laughs> core fundamentals of how Wi-Fi work haven't changed. We've got faster, better things, but the process that Wi-Fi uses a shared medium hasn't changed. Yes, we we have six gig of all the spectrum we can go to, but devices are still in two four and they still have difficulty. And so the thing that that I think why it's still driving in 
our industry, we still are on top of things, is that the fundamentals haven't changed and most of our customers don't have a clue of how Wi-Fi works. It's just this little magic box. They complain about, oh, Wi-Fi is slow, Wi-Fi sucks. It, most of the time, it's not a Wi-Fi problem. An, an example, you go into a, into a hotel, you're in there, you're sitting trying to make a Zoom call and you're having a very difficult time. So you call the front desk and say, Wi-Fi is why it's not working. And we go on site and look and find out the Wi-Fi, your connection from your laptop to the Wi-Fi is 600 meg, but there's 200 units in this hotel and they have maybe a five meg connection or a 20 meg connection out to the internet. It's not a Wi-Fi problem. That's a wireless problem, but it, it comes across as wireless because like, like they, the data shows over 90%, 95% of all phone traffic is over Wi-Fi. So most people's experience with the network, with the internet, they call it Wi-Fi and yet that's not really what's going on. So I, I see part of our job is to educate customers to see the difference between, is it really a RF issue? Is it a Wi-Fi issue? Is my client issue? Or is it really the rest of the network that's behind it? Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I, I see that you have a conference coming up in Prague because our friends at the WBA have been promoting that. What can you tell us about this upcoming event? So our conferences, we hold one in Prague in the fall and one in Phoenix in the spring. We send out this kind of unique way to build it. We send out a survey with everyone who had it. Well, we do a call for presentations. We get the presentations in. We survey our potential attendees. They vote and whoever gets the most votes gets the most speaking time. And then based on the voting is how we put you into the presentation slots. Yeah. We then post that for about 30 days so people can see it. And then we turn it on and registration happens on one day and we sell out within a couple hours. So if you want to come, you kind of have to try hard to be there. Okay. And we get maybe a third of people who sent in a presentation actually get a speaking slot. So there's, there's quite some competition there to see who gets to speak. And all of our, all of our presentations are available on YouTube for free afterward. We, we believe in sharing information, not trying to hold on to it. Okay. I always say information and knowledge is like manure. If you spread it around, you help things grow. If you hang on to it, you just stink. I love that. Now, talking about information, you know, can't have discussion on technology without discussing AI. AI for Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi for AI. What are exciting things you're seeing in AI? Things I like in AI or where people train their models specifically on their own issues. I don't want to use AI in my wireless controller or my, my management system and have it tell me the score of last night's ball game. What I'd like it to do is focus totally on my issues and know exactly what's happening inside. So if I'm, I'm Cisco or I'm Miss Juniper or Aruba or whatever they're called now as they're joined, that my questions and queries are specific to that need and specific to Wi-Fi itself. That helps a lot. The thing I see AI being really good at is something that we've spent 20 years trying to, trying to make work, and that's RRM. We live in dynamic environments, and yet some sites have thousands of APs, and no one can afford to touch those APs manually and change them every time there's a change. So we have RRM systems that automatically adjust those. But it's been a battle for literally 20 years of trying to get RRM to work properly every time in all situations without the tuning that it really takes. So AI should be able to allow us to collect data from the client's standpoint to help in that decision of should I change or should I not change transmit power or channel? And if I did change, did the clients like it or not like it? And then adjust accordingly. For decades, we've been using an AP-centric model. And I think as we move into AI, we're using more of a client-centric model because it's really, is, is the client happy? Yes or no? Then you did something good. If the client didn't like it, then revert back to whatever you had before. Radio resource management. Okay. What about another important trend, which is, you know, now that, you know, technology is evolving very fast, there are security issues, there's a shortage of staff, and that all led to the emergence of network as a service because enterprises would rather outsource their management or their IT infrastructure and including Wi-Fi to a third party company. What, what do you think of network as a service? I think it is a solution looking for a problem. Okay. Not all, not all customers are in that mode. I don't, I don't think your previous statement is accurate. 
not all enterprises want network as a service. They kind of like doing some of the things they do. But there are companies who don't have any desire to manage that, but they've had to for years. So network as a service is a solution for some and a fantastic solution if that's what you need. I've done a lot of work in K-12s and hospitality, and there are places where network as a service would be a, a godsend for their IT teams who don't have the resources to dedicate on something as, as complex as Wi-Fi. So it's a solution and it's a great solution. I just don't know if it's for everyone. So you're saying a good fit for education, hospitality, what else? A lot, a lot of small businesses. Healthcare, maybe? Some, may, I don't know. Smaller healthcare. If, if it's like a, a, we call them dock in the box, a little emergency rooms, that they don't even have an IT staff on, on staff, it might work. For larger hospitals where they already have IT staff, it, it may be a solution for, it's, a, it's based on size. If you have 2000 AP implementation, you probably have enough IT staff to babysit that and take care of it for yourself. If you have less than 100, you probably would be a, a, a prime candidate for an ads. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the fun stuff now. What do you think like of, the, of the of the gardener's magic quadrants? You know, it's just been there forever. And what's the it, value it of that? What's Well, it depends on who you are. So most of my colleagues and friends and people who come to the WLPC conferences and those thousands of people I've taught courses to aren't the target audience who's buying the MQ information. Those are high level, you know, I mean, their target audience is not the practitioner. And yet sometimes the marketing people within these large vendors are proud. They want to share the world. This is where we showed up in the MQ. So they send out just this very simple picture and there's a dot that represents them and they're in one quadrant and they are happy with it or they're sad with it. The end users who I deal with all the time don't care because they're not the target audience. They weren't the ones that were interviewed along the way. They see the world in a different standpoint. They're not who the analysts talk to. So the data they see sometimes feels disingenuous to what they see in their day-to-day -day life. And yet there is, you know, after I posted something on LinkedIn and got hundreds of thousands of people commenting and, and talking about it, I went and did some research. I read a couple of books. I read hundreds and hundreds of pages online of how the whole analyst community works. It is a business in and of itself. In fact, Gartner is bigger than most of the vendors that are trying to evaluate. They're a huge $5 billion industry. So it has its own rules and the way it works. All of us down here at the bottom, all we're doing is daily turning stuff on and off. We're not even involved in their world. And yet somehow we get told that this MQ is really important. And it might not be important to us, but it's definitely important to people who are in that space. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I have my own thoughts, which I, I will keep uh, for now. Given that I'm an analyst too, and it must come across as, you know, bad mouthing, but appreciate at least your perspective, because I was always curious to see what they do. Actually, people, the people that were supposed to care, do they care not about this? Well, it all, and I'm sure even in your analyst work, you talk to certain people and get their feedback and report what you see from talking to those people. If you talk to a different set of people, you have a different answer. And yeah. that, that's just true. That's just how things work. So I don't believe Gardner, in fact, I've never talked to anyone who's went with their analyst and talked to the end users, the people who are day-to-day -day in turning on and off systems inside real networks. They yeah. talk to a different audience. So whoever, whichever audience you talk to, you're going to get information from them and you will be able to accurately describe back to that audience the feedback that you've received. Okay, I appreciate that. Let's move on to our final question here, which is, what would you do if you had a magic wand to solve tech issues? If, if I had a magic wand, I would change everyone's knowledge of how the technology works. So many people believe what a salesperson tells them, or they read in a marketing slick, or they see somebody post a YouTube video or a TikTok video, and they go, oh, that must be how it works. Sorry, it doesn't. There are actual engineering, physics, things that happen. And most customers, whether they be a CTO or just a small business, don't actually know what's going on. And so they, answer, they, they think things should work a certain way because that's how they want them to work, rather than going through the process of learning how they actually work and then adapting accordingly. I, I call this the Android versus iOS issue. So if you are, you're looking for a phone, 
and you want control over all the things you want to deal with by an Android. You have lots of little nerd knobs you can touch and tweak and turn. If you want to not worry about your phone and just use it, you buy an iPhone. But if you choose an iPhone, you have to play within their rules. You do it the Apple way. You, you, your phone can work fantastic for you, but you have to do it their way. Our vendors in wireless try to hit people where they want to do it their way, but then some people want to do it their own way. And so there's different vendors who play to those different strengths, whether it be iOS versus Android or Cisco versus Ruckus, they're out trying to solve technical problems. If more people understood what was actually going on, the actual technology, that would be my magic wand because then all this hype about, oh, why, why is it is going to do 4.6 gigabits? It's not, it never will. And people are using that. An example some people have given, and I like it, is when you take two Wi-Fi APs and you speed test against them each other. It's kind of like drag racing a school bus. Sure, you can take two school buses and put them in a drag race, but that's not what school buses are for. APs are not, that's, they're not built just to win drag races of who's the fastest. It's solving other end customer problems. So my magic wand would be education. Everyone knows everything. And then we get better answers that way. You, you know, I, I promise it was the last question, but actually you touched on something that's very dear to me, which is open source and, you know, vendor neutral technology. Do you envision a day where, you know, you'll have an abstraction layer where you can manage different vendors through a single pane of glass? And is that something that your members care about? Or I think everyone cares about that. That has been a goal of mine for 25 years. From 802.11, I think it was F, like way, way, like even before like EFG, before G, they had an interoperability standard that's now been deprecated because the business economics just doesn't work. Vendors have for 25 years been in the IP trying to put in pieces so that they're partially standard, but it's, there's also options so that they can have their own secret sauce. And that's how the companies grow and are differentiate themselves. So they have to be a standard, but they also have to have something extra. If you took that out and said, well, we can put anyone's hardware with anyone's software and there's this magic layer that puts it together, well, that'd be fantastic. But I don't know who would run the business. Yeah, yeah. I think there is an opportunity for vendors to differentiate based on their particular secret sauce of AI engine, but we can leave that for another discussion. I, I think there's a desire there's a need. I don't know if there's a business model that can support that in the long term. Okay. Well, this was fantastic, Keith. Really a pleasure meeting you and discussing Wi-Fi with you. And hopefully I'll get the chance to participate to one of your events. We'd love that. Thank you. Thank you.